Good morning. Welcome to Misty Creek Community Church, folks. My name is Stephen Street, and I'm the senior pastor here. We are really glad that you've chosen to worship with us today in this beautiful place. I do want to let you know about a couple of things because you're probably wondering, you know, where bathrooms are and, and how all this works. Well, bathrooms are downstairs. You go right through here, and you can go in the middle of the worship service, or worship doesn't matter. If you need to go, you follow the signs down. If you want to go outside, you can go outside and walk all the way around. But really, the easiest way is right around that corner, and it's lit so you can see. Also, if you've not already done this, maybe it's your first time, and we are, we are excited to have first-time guests with us. We hope you'll keep coming. Um, we have these connection cards inside of your bulletin. We'd love for you to complete that. If you put your email address on there and star beside it, we'll put you on our email list. If you don't put a star beside it, then we won't put you on the email list. But if you want to be on our email list and receive updates about what's going on, we would love for you to complete this card. And you can place these cards in any one of our welcome stations right outside the door there and under the tent. And speaking of the tent, that's where we gather before and after the worship service. If you get here early, you can get some donuts and some um, lemonade and some water and some refreshments. And after the service today, we want to invite you to gather outside of the tent. We have a nostalgic baseball treat for everybody. Aren't you excited about that? I am. I'm going to be thinking about it the whole service. I'm wondering, what is that? But anyway, we're going to have that for you. We're going to be talking a little bit about baseball in a little while during the sermon, so I want to let you know that. But um, there are a couple other things. Um, if you'd like a t-shirt... It may be your first time, so I'm not ready for a t-shirt yet. This is my first time. But if you'd like one, my wife Karen, who's back there, she'll be under the tent after the service and has t-shirts if you'd like to purchase a t-shirt or a magnet. We also have magnets. So just some housekeeping things. I want to invite you to come back next week. That's, that'll be July the 28th. Uh, we're going to have a special guest here uh, doing something that's transformational during the service. And that's all I'm going to tell you. But let me just tell you, it is going to make a huge difference in your life. Uh, next Sunday, what's going to happen in our service. So we're, we're thrilled that you're here. And now I want to thank Doug Allen and our worship team. They're going to lead us in worship this morning. Uh, so let us, let us now stand and open our hearts and receive what God has for us to receive this morning. We start the countdown again. Well, and we're that little technical issue here. Oh. Well, hold on. Let me check that out real quick. Y'all pause. I'm to Tom Bodet. Welcome to Motel 6. That's what that sounds like, dude. Motel 6, remember that? Good morning. How y'all doing? Yeah. Missed y'all last week. We were at the beach, kind of, you know, recharging the batteries. You got to do that once in a while, right? So we've had quite a morning with audio faux pas and whatnot. I think we, I thought we had exercised all those demons, but we got a few more pop rearing their head this morning, so... Just bear with us with all that. Well, let's pray and we'll get started here. Let's invite God to join us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. We thank you for this new day. We thank you for life. We thank you for another opportunity for us to be able to celebrate you, to show you our love, to pour out our hearts to you, Father. We are a thankful people. We are grateful for all that you've done for us, Father, for the love that you've shown us. And so we just want to give that love back to you this morning. We invite you in, Holy Spirit, to have your way within us. And we just pray that you would, uh, would change us and mold us, transform us, sanctify us even now, Father, to be more like Christ when we leave this place than when we got here this morning. So, Father, as we sing this first song that we all know so well, this hymn, the solid rock. And, Father, I think of the saying that, that Jesus plus anything equals nothing. And that Jesus plus nothing equals everything, Father. So we know as we sing that our hope is built on nothing less than your blood 
your holiness, your righteousness, Father. So that's what we cling to. And we know that the love and the grace and the mercy and the power that you offer us as children of the living God is more than enough for us. So we pray that you will be pleased with this praise. We sing from grateful hearts to honor you and glorify your name, the matchless name, the holy name, the righteous name that is above all names, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 And let's sing to him now. You are the 
By the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. So, Father, as we sing this song to you, 
I need, I personally need, I need your Holy Spirit to reveal what your will is. Apart from you, I don't, I don't even know what my best interests are, what they look like, Father. But with the Holy Spirit, with the revelation that comes through you, that's when our, our will is brought into alignment with your will. The good and perfect things that you have planned, the good works that you plan in advance for each of us to do, that's when all that comes into alignment, Father. So as we sing this song, may they not just be words, but may we be dedicated our lives as, as we sing this all on the altar before you, Father. Anything that we're clinging to, any gods in our life, any idols, any little G gods, Father. And if we're being honest, we've all got some. May we, right now, as we sing this song, place those on the altar before you with open hands and say, Father, here I am. Use me however you see fit. So, so that is the nature and the heart of this song, Father. And we want these words to be true in our lives and our relationship with you. So do, do a work as we sing to you.
keep him first in your life? Really? Do you? Is he first in your life? And who is he? Yes. Jesus, of course. That's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We are, we are Trinitarian believers, aren't we? For sure. Hallelujah. Thank you so much to our worship pastor, Doug Allen. I also want to thank some of our guest musicians today, Chastity, who beautiful vocals. Charity. Did I say chastity? <laughs> got, it says chastity here. Sorry. It's charity. Charity. And then uh, Doug was on bass. Another Doug. So that should be easy for you to remember. And Barry on vocals and guitar. He's a, he's a regular with us. Carl on guitar. Regular with us and does our video for us. And um, we also want to thank... Who was on our drums today? Scott. Wasn't he amazing? Very good drummer, so thank you so much for being with us today, worship team, and I'm glad that you are here today. Um, I want to invite you, if you want to, you don't have to do this, we have provided some sermon notes for you. Um, you can take these home with you, you know, make paper airplanes with them, whatever you like to do with them, but they're there for you if you'd like to use those today to follow along a little bit. <sighs> so good morning, my MOG friends. Did you know that you're my MOG friends? What is a MOG? Ministers of God. So you're a mog. I'm a mog. You're a mog. We're all mogs. We're ministers of God. What's up, mog? Yeah, mog. Mog. You're a mog. A minister of God. And you'll hear me say this probably every Sunday that you are ministers. You are. You're ministers of the gospel. Each one of you are called by name to share your faith and tell others about the wonderful good news, the truth, the gospel according to Jesus Christ. So I'm glad that you're here. Don't you agree that we all need to have goals in our life? We need to have some goals in our life. Goals give motivation to our lives. Whether it's the game of baseball, which I'm going to talk a little bit about baseball today, or the Christian life, we need goals. So let me ask the folks that have been coming pretty regularly to Misty Creek ever since we started um, in a home, what are we going to do as a church? Give that some thought. What are we going to do as a church? Now, we've already said that we're going to love God first, that we're going we're gonna to love people and we're going to make disciples. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Do we really need to do anything else? Love God, love people, make disciples? 
But a lot of times in church, we try to make it much more complicated than that, don't we? Do you realize that we're actually leasing this building? We are. And you may have noticed if I pulled this curtain back, it would look like a scene from Les Mis. It would. That the Orbitz Drama Group uses this sanctuary for productions and rehearsals. I think they had something over the weekend in here. Yes. So we, we share this facility, which that's okay because when we walk on to this campus, we realize we're in a sacred place, don't we? It's holy, and God is here. The power of his spirit is here. So we have an opportunity to be a beacon of light right here in this community, right here in Sandy Springs. And we're thankful for First Baptist Church of Sandy Springs for allowing us to use this facility. And they've been so gracious to us to allow us to park in their facility over there, to use their sanctuary, to use their fellowship hall if ever we need to. And as you can see, <laughs> we may need to eventually. So it's a good thing to be in partnership. That's another thing we're going to do as a church. We're going to be in partnership with others. We're not going to compete, and I'll get there in just a minute. You know, you can build a reputation on what you're going to do, but you really can't. Henry Ford said this one time, you can't build a reputation on what you're going to do. You ever given that some thought? You can't build a reputation on what you're going to do. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to grow deeper spiritually. We are. And if you want to be a part of a church that experiences transformation, then you're in the right place. If you want your life to be more fulfilled and more abundant, and no longer just mediocre and average, then you're in the right place. If you want to hear the truth of God, the truth of God's word that's transformational, then you're in the right place. And I'm glad that you're here. And I think you'll find that true today. We're not going to compare ourselves to others because comparison is the thief of joy. It is. Comparing ourselves to another church or comparing ourselves individually to someone else, comparison is the thief of joy. And we're not going to do that. We're not going to compare ourselves to others. And we're not going to focus so much on inconvenience either. You mean I got to go downstairs to go to the bathroom? Gosh. I got to go outside under a tent in the middle of July where it's hot and drink water? I don't understand that. Because here you'll realize real quickly, this is not about you. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. That's why we're here. So it is simple when you think about it. Let me ask you something. Do you love Jesus? Anybody in here love Jesus? Let me ask you something else. Do you like Jesus? Yeah. You know? Okay, now I, I love my wife. You know that. But I like to go on walks with her. I like to sit down with her over breakfast sometimes and have prayer together. I, I just like to be with her. You know, and I love her too. I love Jesus and I like to be with Jesus. And I love being here because I'm with Jesus because guess what? You are his representatives. You, you are in essence Jesus. You're like, nobody's ever called me Jesus before. Yes, because you reflect him and his spirit lives within you. And I want you always to remember that, that you are, as the song said earlier, you're more than conquerors because you're in Christ Jesus. And he loves you and he cares about you. He not only likes you, but he loves you. He not only wants you, but he needs you. Think about that for a moment. You see, when you hear truth based on biblical principles, it stays with you, doesn't it? You're already thinking, ah, this, this is starting to stay with me a little bit. This, this has some depth to it. Because I'm not just preaching to you on some ideologies or some social principles or anything like that. I'm going to preach to you from God's truth. And that's what will make the difference. You'll be able to apply this message every week into your own life and into the lives of others. You'll be able to leave here today having learned something and be equipped to be the saints of Christ. So isn't that a special thing? So I get excited about preparing what God wants to do and what he wants to say for you every week. And it is truly an honor to do that. Now we're going to ask why about a lot of things. We have a lot of questions, don't we? And that's okay. Within the context of the church, the stronger your why, the higher your fly. It's true. So ask questions. Questions about your faith. A lot of people have questions of theodicy, like why God? Why did this happen? Let's ask it. Let's talk about it. Let's be real. Let's don't dance around it. Let's discuss it. You'll have an opportunity as a part of this community of faith to be in a community group, a small group, if you desire to do that, where you can 
wrestle with some of those questions and discuss some of those things and fall in love all over again with Jesus and have accountability partners and people that care for you and will pray for you and visit you and listen to you. There'll be those empathetic listeners that you need. They'll, you'll have the emotional support that you desire so much in the rat race we call life. You'll be able to take the time to come out of the chaos of the noise and hear the still small voice of God through other people. And that's what community is, a community of faith and community groups. We're a community of faith. There was a little boy that was overheard talking to himself as he strutted through the backyard. He was wearing his baseball cap and he had his baseball bat and he had his glove and he had a ball. He walked out into the backyard and he took the baseball and he had the bat here and he said, I'm the greatest hitter in the world. And he took that ball and he threw it up and he swung the bat and he missed it. And he said, strike one. He gathered the ball again and his glove and the bat and he was ready, adjusted his hat a little bit. I'm the greatest hitter in the world, he said. And he, he threw the ball up and he swung again. Strike two, he said. So he gathered the glove and the ball again. He got the bat. He adjusted his hat. He straightened his shoulders a little bit. Got his stance again. And he threw the ball up again. Threw it up. He swung at it again and he missed it. Strike three. Wow. I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. He exclaimed. I'm sure there have been plenty of little boys that at one time dreamed of becoming a great hitter or pitcher in the world of baseball. I sure did. And why not? It's been said that life is made of dreams. If you don't have any dreams or goals in life, you may not get very far. You may not climb the ladder of success, whether it's secular or spiritual or otherwise. That's why Paul said, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Everyone needs some pressing on spirit in their lives to press on to keep moving forward because I'm more than a conqueror I have a goal and my goal is heavenward is eternity and because I believe in Christ now I have the promise of eternity already in me hallelujah praise God his spirit resides in me I'm not a loser I'm not I'm a winner Regardless if I can play baseball or not regardless if I like sports or not I am a winner because I am on God's team and I must admit that life in America is certainly about baseball. Well, I don't know if it's considered our national pastime, but it used to be, you remember? I mean, we used to all watch the Braves. We did. It was our national pastime. It was a big deal. Baseball was our dream. It was our sport, and we loved it. You know, there are three types of baseball players. Those who make it happen, those who watch it happen, and those who wonder what happens? Tommy Lasorda said that, famous manager. I would say that's true of most things in life. Most ball games are lost, not won, lost by lack of genuine effort. I mean, have you ever watched Major League Baseball as of lately? Sometimes those million dollar players, they just don't give a lot of effort, do they? You know, I could have caught that ball in center field. He didn't even try. <laughs> I'm saying that last night when I was watching the Braves. Why didn't you dive for it? You know, golly. Hmm, it's interesting, isn't it? Many things in life are lost just because we don't do anything about them. Doing nothing will accomplish nothing. Those who do something and accomplish greatness sometimes are given nicknames of notoriety. You know that. I mean, take a guess at some of the greatest baseball nicknames of all time. Hank Aaron, anybody? Hammer and Hank, Ty Cobb. You got to know this one. Georgia. The Georgia Peach. Very good. How could we miss that one? Joe, actually, it's Jay Hannah Dean. Dizzy. Dizzy Dean. That's right. We get Dizzy Dean baseball from that. Yes. This was a tough one. Lou Gehrig. Iron Man. Yes. The Iron Man. That's right. Jim Hunter. Think of fishing. Catfish Hunter. Y'all are good. All right. Joe Jackson. Shoeless Joe. You guys are better than I thought you would be. Yes, this is a difficult one. Reggie Jackson, Mr. October. Boom, you got it. Yes, yes. Mickey Mantle. The, somebody said it. The Mick. That's right. You got, man, my son's smart over there. How did he go, son? All right, think of this famous sandwich at McDonald's. All right, Mark McGuire. Big Mac, you got it. Yes, 
Big Mac, filet fish, quarter pounder, french fry, ice cream, sun, and apple pie. You remember that menu, don't you? That's all the menu used to be. Now it's so confusing, I don't know what to order. It's crazy. Yes, that's why it takes so long in the drive through You're like, oh man, what? They've even got a grilled chicken sandwich at McDonald's. 480 calories for that? Anyway, life is a learning process, and believe it or not, we can learn some things from the game of baseball. Yes, we can. Dick Stonefinger Stewart, he was the first baseman for the Phillies, the Pirates, the Mets, the Dodgers, the Angels, and the Red Sox back in the 60s. Said of himself, errors are part of my image. One night in Pittsburgh, 30,000 fans gave me a standing ovation when I caught a hot dog wrapper on the fly. Can you imagine that? We all make errors in life. Fortunately, because of the Lord, they are not permanent errors. How many of you came in here this morning and you're like you're dragging a ball and chain because you're paralyzed by your past failures? You just can't get beyond it for whatever reason? Guess what? Here at Misty Creek, we will give you the tools and the information and the spiritual guidance to forget about it and get rid of it forever. Forever. I'm serious. That's the truth. That's God's word. Life is like a baseball game. Even though it's not mentioned in the scripture, some aspects of the game of baseball are similar to life. In this message, I want to compare our lives to a baseball game. Number one, we're on a team, so be a team player. We're on a team, so be a team player. That's in your notes. Number two, we have a coach, so listen to him. And number three, we may get hurt, so what? Play anyway. We're on a team, so be a team player. Let's start with that one. Even though the scripture teaches that the husband is the head of the home, there should be a certain amount of togetherness and unity in all things. So I want you to hear this. A lot of us are familiar with Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 21 in particular says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Following these words, Paul immediately speaks of the responsibility of both wives and husbands. Submit to one another. Could that also possibly mean work with one another? Could it? Most of us have discovered that in all of life, things work a lot better when we work with people and not against them. This applies to home, work, business, and the church. Working together. That's right. Mutually submitting, mutually respecting one another. Not leveraging our position over one another, but loving each other connecting with each other. That's not just marriage. That's in life in general, ladies and gentlemen. That's being a part of a cohesive team, a network. Brothers and sisters, we are not playing the game of life by ourselves. We're on a team together. We're in this thing together, so be a team player. It doesn't make any difference whether you're the pitcher, the catcher, the first baseman, the second, third baseman, the outfielder, or whatever. You're on the same team. In the church, it doesn't Make a difference whether you're the preacher, the elder, the teacher, the pianist, the worship leader, the soloist. We're all on the same team. We must be team players. The usher, those who set up for the church, those who bring things in, we're all on the team together. We all have a, a role, an important role to play. Romans 14, 9, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and a mutual edification. Romans 15, 1 and 2, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up rather than tear him down because he disagrees with me or he doesn't look like me or he lives on that side of the tracks. We are to build each other up. We are to love each other. Jesus made a commandment. He didn't make a lot of them, but he commanded us to love one another regardless. Regardless. You can ro roll your R with that if you want to. Regardless love each other. In other words, let's do things that help, build, bless, and encourage one another because we're on a team together. We don't compare ourselves and we don't compromise the gospel. We have a coach, so let's listen to it. You know, there, there are some truths that we, we learn as children. And our children are, are watching us every step, everything that we say they're watching us. But we can learn some things from them too. We can. No matter how hard you try, you cannot baptize cats. You can't. You can try it, but you, they're, they're, they're difficult to baptize. They need it. They need exorcism sometimes. <laughs> when your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. It's probably not a wise thing to do. If your sister hits you, don't hit her back. They always catch the second person. That's how it is. Never ask your three-year-old brother to hold a tomato. 
You can't trust dogs to watch your food. Hey, Jingle Bell, watch this for me. You can't trust a dog to do that. It doesn't work like that. You can't trust a cat to do that either. They are finicky though, aren't they? Reading what people write on a desk can, lead you, can teach you a lot. Same thing in the bathroom as well. You can learn a lot of things that you might not need to learn. <laughs> Don't sneeze when someone's cutting your hair or shaving your beard for that way. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it could happen. Just don't do it. Never hold a dust buster and a cat at the same time. <laughs> School lunches stick to the wall. I don't know if you know that or not. You can't hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. It just doesn't work. <laughs> but you want to know something out of all that wisdom? The best place to be when you're sad is on grandma's lap. It's a great place to be. And if you still have your grandma, cherish that. Brothers and sisters, children learn so many things in life, and many of these truths come from their moms and dads. So be it. Regardless of their age, when children are at home, they need guidance and they need direction. Children need coaching about all of life. Everyone needs some coaching in life. You know one of the fastest growing professions nowadays is coaching? I used to think that's hilarious. People are paid to do that, but they are. Coaching, yes, there's Christian coaching. There's coaching for your business. There's coaching for your family. There's coaching for your marriage. There's coaching for how to profile yourself on LinkedIn. There is. There's coaching for all of that nowadays. You can hire a coach, network a coach. Do you know there are image consultants? There are. You hire them, you actually pay them to consult you about your image. Isn't that interesting? I heard that years ago, Bill Clinton asked somebody to do that for him. Didn't work out for him so well, did it? <laughs> There's your side note for a little, ha a little laughter for those who have ADD, like me. <laughs> you know, during, during the 28th Olympiad in Athens, an American runner named Jeremy Warner won the 400-meter race. He's the first white American male to win that race since the 1964 Olympics. Some runner, runner from Grenada, who was supposed to be Warner's biggest threat, but finished fourth, said, I've never seen a white man run that fast before. You see, the 400-meter race is dominated by black runners. How could this young man be so fast? In the first place, he's obviously very talented. In the second place, he has one of the best coaches there is, Clyde Hart, who was also the coach for Michael Johnson, who holds the world record in the 400. You might know that name, Michael Johnson. Warner said of Hart, I've had a great coach, and he knows what he's doing. And Michael Johnson said of Coach Hart, He's just an incredible coach, and it's because he's a teacher. He teaches athletes how to run. And you know there is a, a correct way to run. If you're a runner, you need to learn that or you could mess up yourself really bad like I did when I first started running. But I learned from Tony Del Campo and Elizabeth Hardister how to run. They showed me so I know how to run now. Doesn't help me always because I still like to eat a lot. I run because I like to eat. I have a t-shirt that says that. But running right, correct. Having a coach to guide us because we don't automatically know how to do those things. Before we hit the gym and start lifting weights, we need to know how to do that correctly. You know, should I be doing these squats if I've had two back surgeries? Probably not. But some people will do it anyway because they don't have somebody to tell them that. They need a coach. They need a consultant of some sorts. Brothers and sisters, it pays to listen to your coach in life. If we want to succeed, we must listen, learn, and obey. We don't know everything. Some of us think we do. I'm a know-it-all. Yeah, you know this kind of people. Maybe there's one next to you, and you're like, yeah, it's you. Preaching to you today, stepping on your toes. Yeah, it could be you. You wonder why you struggle and have so much conflict and why people walk away when you enter the room. Oh, there he is again. There she comes. Mr. Know-it-all, you know? You even have those kind of people in the faith. You know, they walk around with their Bible and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be in a Bible study with her or him because they know everything. You know, they're a biblical scholar. They'll correct me if I don't give the right chapter and verse. You know, they walk around, look at me. <laughs> I've taken disciples Bible study. One, two, three, four, and the fifth one that they never did right, but I've already taken it. It's those kind of people. You have to be careful of that. Because being a follower of Christ and being on his team requires a certain amount, a lot, of humility. You know what humility is? Being humble. Now, some people say, well, humility's weak, Stephen. Jesus was humble. Do you think Jesus was weak? I don't think so. I know he was not weak. Humility is a virtue. It's a gift. It's something that God has given us, and he desires us to, to be more humble, to be more like him. And when you're on a team, that's the way it should be, to be humble together. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Did you hear that? Not everyone will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he or she 
who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You know, we may get hurt. That's another principle of this sermon. We may get hurt. So what? Play anyway. We can give in to the hurt and the pain. I'm not just talking about the physical hurt, but the mental, emotional hurt that we have sometimes keeps us from living life to the fullest. Some of you may remember the baseball player Lou Gehrig. He's called the Iron Man of Baseball. You said it. For a very good reason. For 15 years in the 1920s and 30s, he played first base for the New York Yankees. He played 2,130 consecutive games. And after he retired, they x-rayed both of his hands and found that every finger had been broken at least one time. Yet he never missed a game. He played even though he was hurt. That says something about his character. Today, if a major league player strains their pinky, they're, they're out for a month and still getting the paycheck. Just a pinky. But there used to be players that could have broken fingers on every hand, broken ribs, strained necks, herniated discs. They would still play. And they played because they were committed. They played because they loved the fans. And they played because they actually loved the game that much. You see the comparison there with the Christian faith? I love Jesus so much that even when I'm hurting and when I'm in pain and when I've been wronged, I'm going to shout hallelujah, praise God, because I have more opportunities even in the midst of my suffering and my trials to share him with others, to glorify him. So sometimes it's okay to stay with the pain for a little while because Jesus knows your pain. He's been in pain. He's hurt as well. And he can carry you through that. And when you're on the other side of that, you can be such an effective mog, minister of God to other people when you're on the other side of that. And even when you're going through that, you can be by the power of Christ within you. Now, obviously, we have to go on living the Christian life even though we've been hurt. And it's a guaranteed thing in this life we're going to be hurt, maybe a lot, We'll experience hurt and pain in some form or another. And for some reason, it won't just be one time. It'll be many times. And because of the devil or sin or perhaps just because we live in an imperfect world where imperfect things happen all the time, we're going to be hurt. Did he just say the devil? He actually said something about the devil. Yes, the devil is real. Satan does exist. Evil is still around. Yes, many of us still have demons in our lives. And not that all mental illness is a demon, but there's mental illness, there's suffering, there's depression, there's pain, there's issues, there's darkness, there's doubt. That's evil. That's where evil is in the world. And there's help. There's help for that, ladies and gentlemen. And there needs to be more help. There needs to be more places of refuge. There needs to be more support for people who are struggling with illnesses like that, for people who don't want to live, who want to take their life. There needs to be more support where they can feel that they can be transparent and they can be open and they can share what they're going through with others and not feel ashamed. Well, I don't want to tell people that I'm struggling with life that I don't want to live anymore. If we're on a team, we will welcome that. We will share in each other's burdens. That's what a team is in the Christian faith. The Apostle Paul was a great player in the game of life. He endured much hardship in life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, to this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We're in rags. We're brutally treated. We are homeless. We work with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. Now, these words don't sound like Paul was having a fun day or a fun time in life, do they? He didn't just get back from Six Flags, did he? No. Not many of us who would have wanted to trade places with Paul. We don't want to go hungry or thirsty. We don't want to wear rags for clothing. We don't want to be treated badly or brutally. We don't want to be homeless. We like our security. Matthew 8, 20, Jesus says this. He replied, foxes and holes Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus suffered homelessness while in the flesh, and he suffered even more than that, ladies and gentlemen. And we could go on and on about what he suffered and what he endured. Matthew 10, 24, 
A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. Since Jesus suffered in the flesh, should we not also expect to suffer somewhat in this life? We're going to suffer at some point. Some of you are suffering right now, and it is even hard to be here this very moment because you're suffering, you're struggling. Can I tell you something? The Savior that I serve, the Savior that I love, the Savior that I like, he knows. He is the great empathizer. He knows what you're going through and what you're facing. You don't have to go through it alone. You don't have to be paralyzed by it anymore. Second Timothy 2, verses 3, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Since we are soldiers of the cross and we are playing the game of life, we must expect a certain amount of hardship and pain. But we must endure, and endure we can. Because Christ did, we can too. Ty Cobb, considered by many as the greatest baseball player of all time, he played 3,033 games, and for 12 years, he led the American League in a batting average. Listen to this. For four years now, four years, he batted over 400. That's unheard of nowadays. He batted over, maybe in Little League or T-ball, but not Major League Baseball. He batted over 400 on his deathbed, <coughs> July 17, 1961, at the age of 74 years old. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Did you know that? This is what he said. You tell the boys, I'm sorry, it was the last part of the ninth that I came to know Christ. I wish it had taken place in the first half of the first. It's Ty Cobb, considered to be the greatest player of all times. Wow. That's powerful, isn't it? The point is very clear. There is a time when the ball game will end, when the ball will stop rolling. It will not matter whether we hit a single, a double, a triple, or even a home run. <laughs> you know you want to hit one right now, don't you? Wouldn't you love, Reagan? Wouldn't you love to go out there on the softball field and just crank them over the fence every time you got up? Look at that. <laughs> you know, wouldn't that be awesome? He may do that. I don't know. But anyway, it doesn't matter whether it's the home run or the triple or you strike out. What will matter is what we did with Jesus. That's what will matter. And Ty Cobb got to experience that, wow, in the last part of the ninth. And Christ overcame him in such a way that he said, I wish it had taken place in the first half of the first. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The game of life leaves us all very weary and burdened. Some of you are exhausted, aren't you? You're just tired, you know? You need that Holy Spirit adrenaline just to come upon you this very moment. Jesus will give you rest, release, and reward. Believe in him, trust him, surrender to him, obey him. Comfort will come. Worries will cease. I can feel your pain now, some of you. And joy will return. Are you hurting physically right now? Mentally, emotionally, even spiritually. I don't, I don't know where I fit. I don't know where I belong. I don't know if I'm welcome. Let me say something to you right now. You're welcome in this place. And you're loved. And you're accepted. And you're valuable. You're worth everything. You're the trophies of God's creation. Do you know that? Do you realize that? In Him, worries will cease and joy will return, comfort will come, and life will never end. Do you want to experience human wholeness? What is that, Stephen? What is it to be whole? Do you want to experience it today? You see, I think it was providential, I know it was providential that you're here today, and that this is being recorded, and that others will hear this message, and they need to hear this part more than anything else they've heard today. To experience human wholeness. That is the freedom to give and receive love from God and from others. Human wholeness. The freedom to give and receive love from God and from others. I not only love Jesus, I like him. 
I do. I really do. And let's be honest. If you read the Gospels and Paul's letters, he was not always easy to like. He was a radical. He's asking us to do some things that are, that are pretty out there. Take us way out of our comfort zone. So let me ask you, do you like him? Do you love him? Even more than that, do you know him? I mean, really, do you know him? Do you know about him or do you know him? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you like him enough today, this very moment, to release that fear, that inadequacy? I'm just not good enough. Do you love him and like him enough to release even that person that's dragging you down, that's pulling you away? Is illness overwhelming you? Look to Jesus. I want you to stand with me if you would just stand with me. This is not scripted. This is Holy Spirit. Stand with me. Jesus won the battle of pride. Say it with me. Jesus won the battle of pride. Jesus won the battle of fear. Jesus won the battle of fear. Jesus won the battle of depression. Jesus won the battle of depression. Jesus won the battle of anxiety. Jesus won the battle of anxiety. Jesus won the battle of anger. Jesus won the battle of anger. Jesus won the battle of jealousy. Jesus won the battle of jealousy. He won the battle of lust. He won the battle of sin. He won the battle of sin. The battle is over. Sin and evil has been defeated. He is victorious. And he lives and he reigns. There's no need for you to live defeated any longer. So today, release your inadequacies, your struggles, your problems, your fears, your anger. Let him take it from you. Just close your eyes and say, Lord, I release my inadequacies to you. Lord, I release my insecurities to you. Lord, I release my pain to you. Lord, I release my grief to you. Holy Spirit, speak through me. Holy Spirit, live through me. Holy Spirit, love through me. Holy Spirit, be reflected through my face, my eyes, my whole body. Come, Holy Spirit, be the guide and guardian of all my ways. Fill me anew with yourself that I would manifest your fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and yes, the very hard one, self-control. I am yours. I am yours and you are mine. Here I am. Here I am. Lord, use me. Fill me up and use me. I don't want to wait till the last half of the ninth. I'm starting anew right now in the first. The game of life that does not end until I meet you in the sky, eternity. So Lord, Jesus, my coach, put me in. Put me in, coach, because I'm ready to play. I'm ready to play. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's creation, his people said very loudly, amen, amen. We're going to have some fun today as we close the service. I was telling my son, we're going to do this John Fogarty song, Center Field. You ever heard it? Dad, everybody knows that song. Is he, was he right? Does everybody know it? Yeah. So we're going to have fun with it. Now, when, when Paul was writing his epistles back in A.D. 50, 55, 60, there wasn't baseball, but there was running. And, and Paul would compare oftentimes the Christian life to running a race. You remember that? Who cut in on you? You were running such a good race. 
And so if there were baseball, he would say, why are you sitting on the bench? Get in the game. Get in the game and play. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. So that is uh, it's, it's going to bring kind of new meaning to this song. So good. let's have some fun. As we, as we move forward. Hear now this benediction. Go forth knowing that He has called you by name. 
that when you pass through the waters, He will be with you. And the waves, they will not overcome you. When you pass through the fire, He will be with you. And the flames, they will not consume you. Do not fear. For He is the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And He's called your name. You're up. You're next. And are you ready, willing and able to fulfill the call He's placed in your life? If so, He'll take you on the greatest journey, the greatest game you've ever been on. And it will last throughout eternity. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Good one, peace, my friends.